Jack the Yee, Vuckus Falcha. Hi, hello, and welcome. It is John O'Sullivan from the Irish Pagan School, and we are here with another Wednesday check in, chat, catch up, and coffee, to be honest. So I'm sipping away from my IPS mug, one of my personal favorites. Um, not just because it's the, the brand for our Irish Pagan School, but also because of its size. This is 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 quite a substantial mug. It's it's um Oh gosh, it's like a twenty ounce. I think is is how it would be in in American measurements, um. But but it fits the hand nicely, and you know has a, a good shape and form, and a, a viable quantity of coffee for an individual of my stature. Um. Today we're going to have a bit of a check in chat about the Morrigan and me. Um. It it comes up time and again. Like a, I talk about being a Dagda guy, and the god I work for is on Dagda Moor, but that doesn't mean I'm solely only ever connecting to talking to praying to or the occasional offering to the Morgan as well. But before we dive into that, we have a free gift for you here from the IPS. It is a five day challenge. It's a five day Morgan lore challenge. So you can find that at morganintensive.com. If you pop over there, it then gives a well, it's it's exactly what it says in the tin. Like it is five days of lore, five days of kind of prompts for anyone looking to explore the Morrigan, explore their relationship with the Morrigan, explore their interest in the Morrigan, learn more information about the Morrigan from the lore sources, but then also to engage in a, a regular practice, a regular practice of engaging with it, um, setting some intentionality, setting some time aside um, for one's spiritual interactions and spiritual growth. So again, morganintensive.com, you can pop over there and, you know, at the Irish Pagan School, we do a, a program known as the Morgan Intensive once once every year. And um, for those who already have some connection with the Morgan or are kind of already working with the Morgan in some way in their life or interacting with the Morgan in some way. And if they want to deepen that connection, if they really want to to invest deeply in that, we run a program for that called the Morgan Intensive. Um, and it is intense. So it's the Morgan is a fantastic goddess. And I suppose that's where I should probably pick up and start talking about the Morgan and me. So, yeah, I mentioned I'm a Dagda guy. I am. Um, but before I ever knew the name of the Dagda, before I ever had the, the word Dagda to put upon the energy that had been hovering around me, um, I heard of the Morgan. Uh, I heard of the Morgan true a the, the Morgan priest in Ireland um or uh, the one I knew of Laura O'Brien um I've told this story at a couple of other occasions um there's a video on the YouTube there about how I met the Morrigan um I, I thought it was a funny thing I also did another one for how I met the Dagda to, to talk about the initials of the relationship the the opening kind of thing the opening interactions but uh it turns out I've enough O'Connor blood in me and my past so that a blood oath sworn by an ancestor of mine was enough to have my ass hauled across the, across the country uh, seven seven years ago, eight years ago now. <laughs> quick maths, not so quick maths. I was 33. Yeah, nearly nine years ago now. Um, In order to climb down into the cave of the cats and, and you know, turn up because she called me. Um, But, and this is where the story kind of su takes a surprising turn for a lot of Morrigan people out there. Um, she called and I said, no, thanks. And people kind of seem shocked by that. People, <laughs> I, I have had strange looks from Morrigan folk. I have had fearful kind of like you did what, you know, um, people kind of not, not understanding that, you know, at a certain degree, from a certain point of view, I am, I, I have free will. I am a person of will and my will and my intention is something that I get to decide in my own existence, even if that is my connections and my relationship with deities. Um, and again, same with the Dagda, when eventually I was given the Dagda's name and I could define true understanding, true having a name to, to define that energy. He was very patient, but I told him, "Yeah, no thanks. I'm I'm not here for this. I'm I'm not here to work." But then, when I had a need, I called on him and I said, "Okay, you want to make a deal? We can make a deal. But here's the expectations." 
And that's how I became a part of the DAG. That's how I started doing the talk. I've, I've always been a storyteller. I've always been writing the tales and exploring them for myself. But what he wanted was say the name out loud uh, was the, the main kind of thing because it wasn't said anymore in Ireland. Um, the very landscape that he made, like the Hill of Tara, I used to live near there. That was where I walked my dog before he passed away, bless him. Um, for for many, like daily, I was going to the Hill of Tara because it was a, a cool place to go for a walk. I didn't know at the time, but I was on pilgrimage. I was on spiritual pilgrimage without even realizing it. Um, so I'm not here to talk about the Dagda, I'm here to talk about the Morrigan. So Morrigan people are are fantastic people. They really, really are. And the Morrigan is a fantastic goddess. She really is. She is amazing in so many ways. And there's a lot of misinformation and, and confusion about her because of the way she shows up in the stories. Um, like there is a reference to Namorinya, which is the Irish, the Gwelga for like na Morinya, which refers to them as a collective or a group, but that doesn't make them this trope triple goddess circumstance. Um, there is Nevin, the Morrigan, and the Bive. Um, and so those are different aspects of the deity, but there is also the Morrigan herself centrally. And she is a goddess of poetry, battle, and prophecy. And like that's 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 core that's core. Those are her tenets. Now it doesn't mean she's not capable of anything else, because as we see with all of the two of the Danan deities, they are very much, you know, as much as Lou gets the the position and the title of being Ildanach, he of the many interlinked skills. Um, the Dagda is also referred to as Savildonach, which is mastery of many interlinked skills. Um, now, yeah, I need to stay on track here, John, because I could spin off into, you know, the difference between the Mar between the Dagda and Lou, and why did Lou get the seat of the sage and Tara if Dagda had been there? I don't think he would have gotten in through the door, but it is the way the story goes. But the Morrigan, as much as is she is defined by those kind of core elements, it doesn't mean she is not capable of other things. But when we look at the tales and the stories, the character and the attributes of her do come true in very specific ways. And that then gives us an insight into her perspectives, her mindset, her agenda, and you know what she kind of calls for and expects for those who work from her. Um. I have met many, I've had the honor to meet many Morrigan people in my time, and I'm delighted to kind of chat to them about all about their experiences, about the goddess and how they interact with her in many ways. And a lot of them are like, you're a Dacta person? There are Dacta people in the world? And I'm like, yes, of course, there's Dacta people in the world. And the Morrigan just may have been more active in her recruiting process before <laughs> um, for a longer period of time. But there are Dacta people out there, too. Um, but yeah, a lot of them kind of have a, a respect for her. Like they, they know, they know who they're dealing with very clearly. There is no hesitation in their mind when the Morrigan contacts them. And Laura has done a lot of videos on, is the Morrigan calling me? How do I know it's the Morrigan? And there's a lot of occasions where people think it's the Morrigan, but it's not. You know, or someone says, oh, well, maybe it's the Morrigan. But when the person who's having the experiences themselves goes and does the work, they come back with someone else entirely. Um, oh, um, just on, on that, if at any point you are experiencing trepidation, hesitation or fear as part of your connection to spiritual entity, stop. I will say that again. If at any point you're experiencing hesitation, or like, no, actually straight up fear. It's okay to be confused. It's okay to be unsure. But if you're in straight up feeling fear and your spiritual growth, stop. Like it, there's some underlying process that you need to address first before you can go further. You may need to like, you know, look after your mental health more, your emotional health more. You may need to go seek counseling. You know, th it just means that there's something else that is in, in out of balance. Um, and, you know, Time and again, I, I hear from people who's like, oh, well, the Morrigan's a scary goddess. Okay, I can understand. Like, I'm not going to tell people that, you know, th their fears are unfounded. I'm not going to say that you can't be afraid. That's not what I'm here for. 
what I would say is if you are experiencing fear when you are thinking about or working with or in, approaching and practice with the Morrigan, then you need to sit with that fear because the reason why we feel fear is because it's to give us, it's a survival instinct. It means that like, you know, some part of our instinctual being is not ready for that, not ready for that next step. And some part of our, our instinctual being is telling us that, no, this is not for us. Um, I've, I've seen it very physically. I've actually had the honor to, again, bring tour guides, you know, in, in the pre-COVID world. Um, we had a lot of people coming in on tour guide groups to go around Ireland. And whenever we went to the cave of the cats, Uvnagoch in Rathcrohan, which is just outside Tulsk in County Roscommon, um, it's in the Rathcrohan complex for Queen Maeve. It's this huge, amazing kind of important archaeological and historical and central ancestral and spiritual place. But of course, right there is the cave of the cats, which all of the stories tell us is the fit abode of the Morrigan. It is this entrance to the Irish otherworld, from which like monstrosities have come out of, but also in the Brick Roost Feast, actually the story Brick Roost Feast in the Ulster Cycle, Queen Maeve herself goes into that very cave and comes out with the three stone-headed cats in order to test the worth of the Ulster heroes, Conal Kernock, Lur Vujok, and Cúchulán. So um, it is clearly said in the stories it is this passage into the other world and i have had the pleasure of going in there once because i was called to go in there once and i showed up with respect i showed up because i i had as i said one of my ancestors put a blood agreement on it so i, I kind of had to um but i've been back there many many times and i felt no need no compulsion no interest in going back down as for other people though i have seen people come there and I have seen people overcome their physical disability in order to go down into that cave. It's that spiritual pilgrimage aspect I mentioned. They are they have come here to get in that cave. And that is the like of all the things they came to Ireland to do, that was the thing that they had to do. Other people um have come within the groups and you know they they're like, "Yeah, no, I'm not really sure, you know, I might go in the cave. I'll, I'll stay at the back of the queue because you have to go in one at a time and you have to kind of scooch down on your butt in this very small, muddy, dark space. And I have actually seen a number of people approach that moment to go across the threshold into the cave and full on nope. As in, nope, out. I can't. Nope, I can't go in there. And it's not about fear of the dark. It's not about fear of claustrophobia, anything like that at all. It is they get to that moment of the Morrigan's fit abode and they, no, I'm, this is not for me or this is not for me yet and so i have you know been present when other groups have come back and come back and a person who had difficulty initially did did go in when they had done their work um as part of their kind of pilgrimage to self and their kind of initiation to self um we don't at the irish pagan school we don't offer any initiations any kind of process any kind of ritual work like that at all and um, we are, are teaching irish paganism we're teaching the lore the information the mythology but then we're also talking about the the practical elements the the cultural elements the identity the energy work all those kind of things but we're not in it we don't do initiations we don't kind of bring people in we're not forming any form of collective or working group or coven or whatever other kind of words might fit for that um laura and i joke about it if we were just a little bit less ethical we could 100 percent form a cult and be absolutely minted <laughs> but we won't um because that's an injustice and that's not the right way that is not as we coin in here core quiveness the right relationship um that is fundamental to our processes here at the irish pagan school so I did steer off the Morrigan content there. So let's let's pull it back on track. Um, the cave is a, an amazing experience. I have been outside it many, many times. I've been inside it once uh, and I still don't know what it looks like inside because I went in with no lights whatsoever because that was my calling to do. I had to go into her darkness and to meet her in that space. Um, and funnily enough, oddly, actually, um. Just to, to physically describe it for you, um, it is a it starts at the top end of a man-made souterrain, which then goes down into what we believe is a, a group of limestone caves, um, naturally formed limestone caves in that area, but the back of the caves have collapsed. So once you go beyond the man-made section, 
there is stories there's like like old folklore about further caves in there but there, there's a collapse has happened in the last few decades and so there's no access beyond that at the moment so you scooch down on your butt into this kind of opening this overhang opening and then there is a hard left turn which goes directly down right so you kind of you have to like turn your legs in front of you scooch forward again because you're going down legs first you're not going down your head first um, and then like you scooch in, you make this hard left turn and then within another foot, it drops below. And like you, you have to scooch forward, your legs go over the drop and then you, you scooch down, you know, into the next part and you descend below the earth. And um, it's not a very long descent. It is a very tight descent. And as I said, it's very mucky. You don't, you don't come out of the cave clean, um, but you can come out of it cleansed actually, interestingly enough. So I was in there um, and I was called in there. I went down in the dark following Laura, the tour guide, because this was this was pre our relationship. Um, she was the only person who I knew I could trust in that space of going into the darkness of the Morgan's cave and not having any fucking clue what was going to happen. But eventually I had my conversation with the Morgan down there and I turned to leave. And Laura's like, no, I she as her process, she needs to stay behind to do her own work with the Morgan. Uh, and always be the last person out of the cave. And so it was only the two of us. She says, listen, you'll have to remember your way out. You'll have to feel your way out because there's no light that comes down into here into the cave. And I turned to look back up the cave and sure, there was a beam of sunlight shining right the way in down the cave on the 15th of August, all of those years ago. And I was like, sure, I can see the way out. There's like sunlight in the cave. And from the back of the darkness behind me, I heard a very surprised, what? <laughs> Um, when Laura's in the darkness, she keeps her eyes closed. That's part of her experience because it it is a darkness, and it, you know it's part of that process for being in that with the Morrigan. But sure, you know she, she obviously opens her eyes and she's like, "I have never seen that before." There was a, a golden ray of sunlight shining right the way down to the very bottom of the cave, and I was like, "Yeah, I'll I'll make my way out. Don't worry about it. It's all grand." Um, so I think nothing of it. I climb my way up out of the Morrigan's cave. And it's only later on when Laura comes out of it. I, she's, As I said, you go in under the cave, you then take a hard left turn and you go down. And so she comes up out of that hard left turn part and I see her kind of checking the walls and I'm like, is everything all right? And she goes, I've been here so many times at so many different seasons and I have never seen sunlight down in that cave. And she thought there was a mirror. She thought someone had put a mirror or something reflective up on the inside of the wall to try and bounce sunlight further down into the cave. Because if we think about it, like you need, the only way you can change the direction of a ray of sunlight is by passing it through a medium of glass or mirror or prism or water. But even then, it doesn't take a 90 degree turn and go down. So um, I don't know whether it was the Morrigan being like, yeah, okay, just I'm done with you, get out. Or whether it was the Dagda being like, let's 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 get him out of there before the Morrigan has conversations with him, further conversations with him, because I told her no. Um, and this kind of is is where I wanted to kind of loop it back to that experience of dealing with the Morrigan. Um, because she has my love and she has my respect, but she doesn't have my service. And now, I, when I say love, I don't mean that I am in love with her. I don't mean it's a romantic love uh, uh, in any way, shape at all. It's it's an affection. I feel affectionate toward the Morgan. And this, I think, is another weirdness that many people, well, yeah, find weird or find kind of odd. You know, they're like, oh, no, I, I couldn't. And it's like, yeah, well, she's, just, she's a goddess. She's a legend. She's awesome. Like, And they're like, yeah, no, she's deserving of respect. And I'm like... Yeah, I know, but I, I love that about her. She's just a legend. Like she's she is absolutely I, I think she's very funny. And other people are like the Morgan's not funny. She's so serious. And I was like, yeah, but she she is kind of funny. I don't laugh at the Morgan ever. Um and I, well, okay, hold on. Sorry. I have made to my chagrin, I have made a number of let's say off the cuff, off collar remarks about us, about her. And um it, it's generally playful uh, okay from my side it's always playful i um, never out of disrespect but <laughs> i've been in company of morrigan people and received death stares <laughs> like you know people is like how dare you say that about the morrigan 
Um, there's one of the Irish Bacon School groups is known as the Morrigan's Cave, and it is Morrigan centric talk. It is about Morrigan people sharing talk about Morrigan, about the Morrigan, so solely focused on the Morrigan, which, as we know from a, an energetic pagan perspective, is an act of service and an act of raising attention and raising energy for a goddess. And so, you know, also, if you are going to join the Morrigan's Cave, it is free to join. You can join that community. But remember, stay on target. Like it's a Morrigan space for Morrigan talk by Morrigan people. Um, and so don't come in there with your love and light kind of fairy memes or on like that at all, because you'll be told where the rules are very clearly. Um, compassionately, but, you know, it's important to make sure that the boundaries are maintained. And so in the Morgan's Cave, one occasion, I, I, I again, I have my relationship with the Morgan. It is my connection, my 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 spirituality and that's that's one thing we always talk about here at the irish pagan school it is your spiritual connections your spiritual relationship that you're developing with these gods and goddesses and you know i affectionately refer to her as lady m sometimes you know when i don't say the morrigan or the full like like you know when i don't go all into it and so if i'm just and so i i wrote a post into that group um because a lot of people were struggling with the seriousness of the Morrigan. And so I was like, but you need to understand that like you have the right to say no. You like you have the personal sovereignty. You you yourself are the embodiment of your will as formed by the old cultural influences that you grew up with. But that doesn't mean a god, a goddess, anyone else in this world gets to decide for you what what you should or shouldn't do or should or shouldn't say. You know, there there has to be some like there, there has to be that self ownership, that personal sovereignty, um. And so, I was talking about the personal sovereignty, and I meant I I referred to like yeah sure. No, I went to the cave for Lady M, had a chat with her, and I was like no peace out, thanks very much. Uh, you know, you have my love and respect, but not my work. And the comments erupted. <laughs> Everyone got in the comments like, how dare you refer to her as Lady M? How dare you refer to her as not not by her proper title as the Great Queen, the Moriachan, um, or Namarania, or the Morrigan. Uh, and so it caused some controversy and I had to come back in and say, listen, folks, you know, I do that all as well, but also it is my relationship with her. And when I you say that, I say it from affection. I don't say it from disparagement. Um, and that can cause a bit of concern for people. I've actually been standing in and around like tour guide groups and made remarks like slightly irreverent remarks about the Morrigan because I'm I'm a joker at times. And I've literally had people step away from me. <laughs> I've had Morrigan people take one step further away in, with a look of shock on their face, expecting me to be, I don't know, pelted by crows from the sky or like, you know, struck by like blood red lightning or something like that. Like the Morrigan... The Morrigan is business. She is a god with an agenda. She is a deity with power. She is a deity with purpose. Um, and she can be very strict. She can be very demanding for those who she chooses to call. Because not everyone is like anyone. She, yeah, she'll take service from anyone because everyone has a value. But she does have people that she calls specifically for purposes for her own agenda. And, you know, in certain ways, she doesn't take any shit. And so for some people on their spiritual path, if they're looking for, you know, uh, a mother goddess or a gentle, caring, cautious, like deity energy, that's not the Morrigan. <laughs> you know, it, actually, if you're looking for caring energy, look to the Dagda. Absolutely. Guy will take you on board, give you a cuddle, tell you it's all OK and get you a sandwich, you know. And then also once you're relaxed and calm, he'll set you right. But like, you know, this is what you should be doing next. He won't tell you like 15 steps down the road. He'll just say, just do this next thing. And that is a, a marked difference to Morgan people. Morgan is like, here's the strategy. Here's the plan. Here's where we are of the next five year plan, you know, into the next 15 years, into the next 50 years. The Morgan has that agenda. The director will just tell you, I just need you to turn up on Thursday. I was like, yeah, but what are we doing on Thursday? I'll tell you when you get there, you know, and for, for me, working with him has been an exercise in faith, <laughs> many, many acts of faith of just, you know, just do the next thing. And that has actually helped me with my own processes of anxiety. And some people need to have a clear guideline. Some people need the Morgan kind of here's the clear purpose. Here's the agenda. Here's how you're part of the plan to move this forward. Or here's the aspect that needs to be settled that you're involved in. 
for other people, you need you just don't need to be told X, Y, and Z because it becomes too much, becomes too big. And the dads will just say, just turn up on Thursday. Or, you know, just make me a coffee and, you know, just say my name out loud every day. And then over time, it builds up differently. Mm. So, um, yeah, my relationship with the Morrigan appears to be different. I have, I've, haven't met anyone who has the same relationship or similar relationship to the Morrigan as I do. But that doesn't make it unique. It doesn't make it. Well, OK, it does make it unique because it's mine and I am a unique individual, but it doesn't make it special. You know, I'm not some kind of special chosen boo-boo who gets away with stuff because he can. You know, I'm I'm, I'm sure one of the days my butt will write a check that Morgan is definitely not going to fucking cash and I'll be called it in for it. Um, but that is part of the journey and part of the process as well. So when I talk about my love and respect for the Morgan, that is what I'm talking about. Like, you know, I have prayed to her. I have made offerings in there for her. I have... Yeah, I have on occasion kind of pleaded with her to intervene in certain aspects that I know the Daida could do, but I know that she might be, she might find it easier to do. And that's why I would pray to her, not because, you know, the Daida couldn't do it, but I think it would fall more within her ability, more within her kind of wheelhouse, like not that she couldn't do anything else. And this is the complexity you get when you're dealing with Irish gods. You can talk to any one of them about pretty much anything and they're going to have, they're going to turn their hand to it. But when you're dealing with certain aspects, sometimes you just need that direct energy, that main purpose. Um, and so, you know, I do as a data guy still on occasion, pray to the Morgan. So um, this has been the Morgan chat. I wanted to have a quick check in and a quick banter around hopefully it's giving you some insights into my relationship with the morgan but as i said it is unique and the thing to really come back to is on your spiritual journey you need to you know start from where you are to find your relationship with yourself and then from there you can define your your relationship with these deities but if at any point you are hitting fear you're hitting blockages you're hitting kind of like you know difficulties extreme difficulties stop Absolutely. There, there, there's a reason why we experience fear. And that is our instincts telling us that there's something else we need to be something we're missing. There's something else we need to figure out. There's something else that we need to do for ourselves before we can go further. The Morrigan is not a goddess who will haunt your dreams or give you nightmares just for the fucking shits and giggles of it. She doesn't, she, <laughs> of all the gods and goddesses I've come across, she doesn't do things for the shits and giggles of it. She's not the kind of person who's like, oh yeah, I'll just do this for the crack. He is. The dagger 100% be like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, I'll just, you know, see what happens when we roll the hedgehog into his bed one night. Like, he'll do that for the crack. She wouldn't. You know, she'd put the hedgehog there to test you to make sure that you're checking your surroundings, checking your stuff before you go into bed. So, not that I would expect the Morrigan to put a hedgehog in anyone's bed. And please don't go putting hedgehogs in people's beds. Green yolks, hedgehogs are delightful parts of any ecology and need to be respected and loved as well. Um, but the Morrigan doesn't do anything without a purpose. And if you're if you're feeling fear or resistance in developing your relationship with the Morrigan, it's because there is a purpose for that. Maybe it's not the right time. Maybe you need to figure out something else for yourself first. Um, but that has been my chat. That has been an insight into my relationship with the Morrigan, but also some information that might help other people as they're approaching their connection with the Morrigan. And um, what I would remind again is that there is that free gift, the five day challenge. It is available morganintensive.com. You can go in and just download it. It is a number. You sign up for it really. And then every day, five days, you get an email which gives you a, a piece of Morgan lore to focus on, to kind of explore, to learn more about, and then maybe to do a journey on to kind of deepen or develop some practice in regards to in interacting and engaging with what I think is a really fucking awesome goddess. She is a, a, a legend and I absolutely like, I find her hilarious and I think she's lovely, but not like, not like cuddly lovable, not like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm definitely a mommy goddess, but she is absolutely hilarious in her own way. And uh, someone definitely worthy of respect and uh, worth getting to know. So from all of us here at the Irish Pagan School, Guru of Mila Mahagas, thank you very much for being with us. And until next time, look after yourself and take care. Goodbye. Slán.